So good morning. Um, as I already mentioned, um, the most of the work I'm going to present here is done by Daniel Herhoff. And uh, Daniel and I, I are working at the, the research center Udic in Germany. Uh, so anyway, um, Daniel and I, um, uh, Daniel canceled, but uh, I'm working at the research center in Germany. It's um, okay. Thanks. Um, it's uh, located in the very most western part of Germany. So here's Berlin and here's Cologne. You, you've got Netherlands here and here's the research center. Mainly in, this, um, in the middle of nowhere. We are, uh, yeah, uh, we are a large research center with about 5,000 employees. And I'm working at the UD Supercomputing Center, which is just one of the institutes. And you see here, um, our institute members, we are roughly about uh, 2,000, uh, 200 people working on supercomputing stuff and uh, scientific applications. So the division where I'm working in uh, is the division for uh, civil safety and traffic. So uh, it's about 20 people. Some of them are missing here. I'm taking the photograph, so I'm also not on this one. And the main topic is actually pedestrian dynamics. So we run um, a lot of validation experiments, laboratory experiments. We develop new models. Uh, however, we also started working on traffic, so how to include uh, bicycles into pedestrian <coughs> dynamic uh, simulation and so on. And um, what <coughs> I'm working on is the um, fire simulation uh, stuff. So what we are interested in beside of the high performance computing is uh, things like if you've got a complex uh, complex geometry with a lot of parameters you not you, which you cannot control, which you don't know, um, you would like to know what's the impact of each of the parameters. So what we do is we do a design of experiment simulations where we vary a lot of parameters all at the same time and can answer questions like, in this case, what's the temperature at a given, uh, given point as a function of alpha from alpha t square behavior, while changing the ventilation uh, fire position and so on and then you, you can uh, quantify what's the impact of uh, of this parameter for example so obviously you cannot do this by hand so you, you need a full automation of this so generate geometries for FDS generate parameter sets uh, run simulation analyze them and we use such automatization techniques also for optimization where we for example couple FDS with all of the automatization um, machinery to Dakota, this is an optimization tool, which uh, then just directs FDS and tells FDS what to do, which parameter needs to be, um, to be uh, evaluated to uh, get the optimization running. And uh, the third point I would like um, adaptive grid methods to, for example, in the first place to do smoke transport in very complex geometries uh, where you can adapt really to the um, to the air movement. OK, so let me first start with a very provocative motivation for HPC and fire simulation. Uh, sometimes I, I, I have to use uh, to, to ask people, why did you use this resolution? And from time to time, I get the answer, uh, well, to have the simulation done by tomorrow. OK, uh, that's uh, not a good thing. It's really bad. So um, however, to uh, get a different answer, uh, you need to have a software which allows you to use all the resources you can gather. Okay, so you, you want to use uh, all the memory, all the cores you've got in your uh, in your cluster to really have the simulation done by tomorrow with the proper grid resolution. So that's the main um, motivation for that, and also somehow to soften the uh, limitation of um, where to put your mesh boundaries while running in parallel. So if you have a look at modern architectures, for example, in a cluster, um, you've got a cluster built out of computing nodes, whereas each node consists of uh, um, a couple of sockets, CPUs, in this case, two. Each of them have one, two, 10, 12 cores on it, which can work together. And in general, these sockets are bound to a memory, uh, a piece of memory. Which means that one of the cores can access, obviously, the memory attached to this socket, while um, it can also access the memory on the other one, because it's sitting on the same node. And whenever you want to use more cores, you've got to use a node interconnect. So there's a natural 
a hierarchy in this system. The shared memory communication or straight memory um, mechanisms and the distributed memory uh, communication which uses the network, InfiniBand, 10 gigabit Ethernet, or whatever you've, you've got to help. And there exist two um, approaches which I will show you here, how to make use of this hi hierarchy. This is well, on the one hand side the OpenMP, which you can run on the compute nodes. In general, you run it on each socket, and MPI for the internode communication. So um, what, what's the difference in here? So imagine you want to compute such a domain. Um, how would you do that in, with MPI? Well, with MPI, you would um, do a domain decomposition. So you would split this mesh in four, for example, and let MPI do the communication. What I mean with that, uh, it's um, for, uh, in the case of FDS, you, um, you, use, you have to use um, stencils with needs neighboring cell values. So with uh, MPI, you need to transfer the uh, neighboring cells, the halo, but you need to do that by hand, okay? So which means you need to really program into your application uh, rank or MPI rank, whatever sends now this piece of memory over to a rank whatever. Okay, so there's an explicit communication which is done by the programmer. And um, obviously you need to have, uh, if you've got a serial application, you cannot just apply MPI. You need to change your data structures and algorithms that to, to get it work. For OpenMP, the thing is a little bit different. If you've got the same domain, for example, and you want to run um, the simulation on multiple cores, then in contrast to MPI where you sp spread processes across nodes or sockets, uh, you fork the main process into multiple threads. I mean, you don't have to do it by hand, but what, what happens is that the main process is uh, forked into multiple threads. And each of the threads may be assigned a piece of the mesh. And as also the OpenMP thread needs the boundary uh, uh, values, they can just look at the memory because it's all sitting at the same node. And they can all access the, the full memory, so they, there is no explicit communication no, uh, necessary for that. And in the very simple case, it might be enough just, just to change loops. Uh, not to really change loops, but to adapt loops. So how does, how does it work in a very simple case? Let's start here in the, uh, in the top. So imagine you've got a serial application. And this is the execution time. And you've got just one core, for example, running this one. And what a picture which is, uh, well, nice to think about is that you've got to call tasks. Tasks are groups of execution uh, instructions. Okay, It's not just one uh, instruction, but a <coughs> bunch of them. And you've got, in this case, now eight tasks, which will be um, um, representing our, uh, our execution. And what happens is that in many cases, you've got tasks which are independent of each other. Very simple example. Uh, you, you want to compute the sum of all the numbers between 1 and 100. The order doesn't matter. The result will always be the same. So what you do, you, 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 you could say, OK, I've got, OK, 3 is now a bad number. Let's, uh, let's have a look at this one. So you've got two tasks. One is to add the numbers 1 to 50, and the other one is one, to add the numbers from 51 to 100. The order doesn't matter. They are independent of each other. So what might happen is if you run a parallel in parallel, you could, uh, you've got still the same task, like the blue one is in serial. But in this case here, you could say, well, uh, one of the cores computing the first numbers, and the other one, the others, and in the end, they combine the, the, uh, their result to get the total sum. OK? So that's how it works. But for this, you need independent tasks. And there is overhead. So while this, uh, at this point, the master forks into two tasks, this causes overhead, and the joining causes overhead. OK? So you cannot apply that to very simple, easy loops. So like adding numbers from 1 to 100, no way, this will be just overhead you're going to see, OK? There will be no benefit. So I'm not going to bother you a lot uh, with, with programming techniques, but just to show you how easy it might be um, to, to use OpenMP. So here is a very simple Fortran example where you do some two arrays into a third one, so A plus B 
R for all the, of the elements of these both vectors. This is a simple loop which uh, does the addition. And if you want to run this in parallel, so like having one of the cores doing the first half and uh, another core doing the second half, you can add comments into the, uh, the source code. So actually, this is a comment, a Fortran comment. However, the uh, compiler, which is uh, capable of doing OpenMP, will see, oh, well, this is an uh, OpenMP command. I will, um, um, in this case, fork the application into multiple threads. They, um, um, the compiler will do the um, work distribution. And in the end, you're going to uh, group every thread uh, together. OK? So it's easy to use. However, in reality, it isn't. As, as always. So there are a couple of issues with uh, challenges with OpenMP, and I will show you three of them which uh, we, we faced during um, the inclusion of OpenMP in FDS. The first thing is the parallel task identification. Well, I showed you before that you, if you've got these tasks which are independent of each other, you can run them in parallel, but you need to know that they are independent <coughs> of each other. Okay? So whenever, for example, a loop calls another function, and the compiler doesn't really know what's happening in this function. Maybe some parts of memory will be touched in that function that has an, have an, has an influence on other iteration in the loop. It won't do any parallelization, because it, it isn't sure. So the programmer must check for himself that he's doing only stuff which can be um, uh, ident identified as, as um, independent. There are data races which means that two threads access the same data. Um, very simple example, uh, you want to add one to, to a value, and all of the threads will do it. So you've got, for example, two threads. Oh, serial application is like this. One, uh, the master looks up this number, adds one to it, saves the number at the same place, so overwrites the value. What happens now in parallel execution? You've got two threads. First one's reading the number. Uh, maybe at the same time, the second one is reading the number, both reading the same number, both adding one to it, and both writing the same number back again. Well, what's the, what's the problem here? Well, if they wouldn't do it at the same time, the first one would read in the number, would add one, write a new number. Then a couple of seconds later, the second task will read in the number, add one to it, and write a re uh, result back. It's a different result. Okay, and this is called a data race, where you basically have no, no help on the side of the compiler nor on the, on the hardware. You need to check for that for yourself, or you need to take care for by yourself. And in, uh, as a third example, loop carrier dependencies, which means if you, the, each loop depends on the result of the other, uh, each loop iteration uh, depends on the results of, the, of another iteration, you've got an issue because they are not independent of each other. But in many cases, if you have a closer look to, not in many cases, in few cases, when you're having a closer look into the structure, you can find transformation to these loops or other uh, algorithms that you get independent tasks. Okay? But this needs thinking and redesign of algorithms. <coughs> OK, so let me give you now three examples for, for these three challenges. One is uh, from the top head filter from the LES module. It's a loop restructure. So how does it work, uh, or how did it work in FDS so far? You've got, um, this is just a representation for a loop. So you're basically looping over the full mesh. I'm not going into details here. You loop over the full mesh, and you've got these three indices, k, j, i, for three-dimensional meshes. And um, you've got a loop over k over j, and then a function call for the filter kernel, which loops over i. And you need to do that three times for i, j, and k. So this is bad for the compiler, uh, because um, in, in here, there is a function call, and also some memory copies, which are also not necessary. So it will not do any parallelization in here, because it doesn't know whether this loop interacts with these two. Okay? However, if you have a closer look into what's really happening, you don't need these function calls. So you can produce a simple loop, which uh, loops over k, j, i. And this is the evaluation of the kernel. It's 
again, a three loops or a simple loop, depending on how you implement it. And then you tell MPI, parallelize this loop. And that's it. There are no function calls. There is these loop structures are very easy. But you need to restructure things to make it easier for the compiler. Another one is uh, are the wall loops. So whenever you want to process data that's sitting at, at a wall or cells at a wall, you've got race conditions. So these cells, for example, are maybe touched by uh, two threads at the same time, which is bad. So what you can do in OpenMP is you can say, well, there is this operation, for example. It doesn't matter what it means. Um, this is critical. Okay? It, uh, you want to do it in an atomic way, which means no other thread is allowed to access this part of the source code at the same time. Well, you might ask yourself, why don't you put it just everywhere? I mean, that would be a good thing. Well, in the first place, it produces overhead, and it reduces parallelization because um, as no other thread can work in here, you cannot do this work in parallel. So it doesn't make sense to put it in overall places. You really need to look into a very critical uh, place. And there's a third example. Um, I'm going to show you the radiation solver. So the radiation solver loops are this way that you've got each cell, uh, a, a data dependency of, for each cell. So this is a loop uh, where um, you go, where the data flow or information flow starts at the left upper corner and moves to the down right corner. And which means that if you loop this way over all cells, You've got this cell, for example, which needs data, new data from this cell and from this one. There is no way in parallelizing that. Because you cannot say, well, thread one is taking, for, uh, let's, let's do it here in the middle, thread one is taking these three cells and the other one is this, uh, taking this one. This one cannot start before this one has finished with this cell. So no way to parallelize that. However, if you have a closer look into that, you see a structure in here if you transform the loops. If you assign, for example, for each of these so-called wave fronts a number, okay, so you, you just see here, here's a four, five, and whatever, then you see that you can compute um, the cells having the same wave from number here, in this case six, all at the same time, because this one can be computed without knowing the result of this one and vice versa. <laughs> So what you do is basically you've got a loop over all wavefront indices, and within these loops you are able to split the work. For example, I mean these are very, these are just simple examples to, to get the idea. So here these fours can be computed by multiple cores. Okay, but for this you need to restructure your your algorithm, and in the end you you get the same numbers. That's uh, that's a must, obviously. So I'm going to show you some um, benchmark results, and uh, therefore I'm going to um, give you a short overview of what was computed in the benchmark. So we used the bench2 input, shipped with FDS. We um, generated different mesh sizes, different domain decompositions. Um, we fixed the number of pressure iterations just to look into the computing power, not into any algorithmic stuff. And we used three different computer systems for that. Um, Daniel's workstation, which is a four-core um, Intel CPU. Uh, Europa 2, it's an HPC system in, in Jülich. It, it, it was set up 2008, 2009, and was on the top 10, on the top 500 list. Uh, right now, it's, uh, I don't know, it's <laughs> way below top 10. But however, it, it's got two CPUs, each of them having four cores. So in total, our compute node has eight. And the, uh, our new system uh, has eight cores for each of the CPUs, in total 16. And all of them are capable of doing hyperthreading, which means, in fact, they've got more cores, more pipelines um, that you should use. So in the end, you should, you should take into account the higher numbers. Okay. So um, as yesterday, we saw um, a couple of quotes from physicists. And me being a physicist, I thought, well, let's continue this one. So after Newton and Einstein, I would like to mention uh, Richard Feynman, who said, uh, at first, you shouldn't fool yourself. Okay? And that's, in, in our context, which means 
that you m should measure everything you do. Okay, you, you shouldn't fool yourself by thinking it's working. You need to have a look at it. And therefore, you should use tools. Okay? Um, I will show you two examples of tools which are quite handy for doing HPC software development. One of them is, for example, uh, is Scalaska. It gives you an overview for a lot of different metrics you, um, you can have a look at, uh, like execution time. So you can say, well, let's have a look at the execution time for all the different routines in FDS. Okay, so you see here these numbers, and you see, well, the execution time of the divergence part one was 44 seconds, of the mass density was 1.9, and whatever. And even further, you can see how much of this time, or how was it this time distributed over the OpenMP thread. And it also continues to MPI and, and so on. But in, in our case, it's uh, So you don't have to add a uh, sophisticated timing in here. You can just use this tool. It um, show, will show you um, hotspots and whatever, so you can quickly um, figure out what's going wrong, for, uh, especially in the case of uh, communication. You see where are the, the issues where the, where the communication is taking too long and so on. The other one is VTune. Um, by the way, the Skalaska tool is developed at our institute. VTune is, uh, is done by Intel. So these are two screenshots. It's, it's not, not one. But just to, to show you what you can do, um, one of the uh, major applications uh, for us is to have a look at the um, at the time loops have taken because um, <coughs> the information about how long a function has, uh, about the execution time of a function is um, might be misleading in a, a sense of if you've got like in FDS very big routines you don't know where is the the meat in this routine okay so VTunes allows you to to have a closer look even at the loop level okay so you see here that the loop at line 1,028 in uh, enthalpy advection is taking that time, okay? So you can have really point to, to the, the, the meat in the application. And the other one is uh, the detection of uh, race conditions. Okay, so you see here an output of VTune. He says, well, here is a uh, data race condition, and it points you directly to the place, okay? So it, you, it tells you there is a read statement in here, so this value, rho z, is, is read. And at the same time, there's a write statement of another process or thread who's writing exactly at the same uh, sp uh, place. Okay? You don't have to think about it because it's you, you, basically you cannot <coughs> detect um, data races by looking at the source code. No, no way. Okay, so with these tools, you can, um, for example, generate. Um, timing information like here, you've got here the functions which are called by the main function, and you see how much time is spent in there. We don't have to go into details, but this is a called uh, so-called top-down view. But you can do also the opposite, the bottom-up view, which means looking from the bottom, where is the most uh, time spent uh, spent in? Okay. Um, so Daniel has... Um, worked on a couple of routines, and um, this is uh, a short list of them. And what he has um, also computed is a parallel percentage. So how much of the uh, execution time was run in parallel? And you see these numbers vary from 17% um, for the pressure solver up to rather high numbers for, for the other routine. So what he did was rather fine in the most cases. And the question is, uh, how, how does the performance speed up look like? Is it speed up, which means the factor by which the execution time was reduced as a function of the number of OpenMP threads used. So in most, in these three cases, you see the maximal one is a, a two. The various lines correspond to different grid sizes, so it's 64,000 cells, 128, and 512. And so the best you can get is a factor of 2 for the 512k um, case. And in all cases, the hyper-threading, which means moving from the four physical cores to the eight uh, cores, 
reduces the scaling. And in this case, it's from 8 to 16 and from 16 to 32. Okay? So in this case, um, hyperthreading is not doing well. Okay, so why is the scaling not ideal? Ideal in this case is this line, which means that if you've got two cores, you would like to have half of the execution time or speed up of two and so on. Well, the fact is that if you have a look at the main function, which is FDS, um, you've got a parallel percentage of 40%. You might argue, well, 40%, that's already good, isn't it? Well, um, a very simplified way of looking into things is, is Amdahl's law. Simple, but good. Um, it tells you, given um, an, a percentage, a parallel percentage of the application and any number of cores, what is the expected speed up? Okay, very simple. You can do the math very quickly. So if you've got an application which, is, uh, which has got 25% running in parallel, you will never have more than 1.5, uh, speed up of 1.5. It doesn't matter how many cores you use. I mean, this is ideal. In, in general, these cores go down. So this is a maximum, okay? Uh, with 50% parallel, which is roughly what you've got then in FDS, you get a factor of two. It doesn't matter how many cores you use. Um, for many other applications I'm also working for, or was working for, you, you've got much higher numbers, and that's what you need. Okay, so to get really these high numbers to use, you, you need 98% or more, so at least 90%. Okay, so there's a long way to go. Okay, another way of looking at things is to look at the performance. So, like, um, not to speed up, but number of cell updates per second. Um, so this graph shows you the number of these updates per second as a function of the grid size, the so number of cells, for different thread counts. And what you see is that these numbers in general rise, but then stuck at one point. So there, uh, um, from this one you can see that there is uh, that you, you you hit the um, memory barrier, which means that memory isn't transferred fast enough to the CPU that these numbers don't increase anymore. Almost done. Okay, so am I. Uh, two slides, very quickly. Okay, so um, what about MPI? Well, on the left hand side, you see the MPI scaling for uh, a few cores. And the red line shows you the speed up again for the for FDS in total, which is I guess fine. This is um, this is the uh, ideal scaling. And just for visualization, there are some other modules from FDS. They they're doing also also well. How about um, combining MPI and uh, OpenMP? Well, um, you see on the right hand side a plot which tells you. For different numbers of MPI ranks on a given number of cores, and um, you see this speed up. So, for example, this orange line, you see um, orange means eight ranks. So you use eight cores in a without any OpenMP, you get this speed up. If you assign two cores for each MPI rank, you get this one. If you assign four cores for each MPI rank, you end up in this number. So in all cases, you, you get more power, more speed up, but it's not ideal. I mean, the slope here is way lower than, than one. And that's already the summary. So um, in, uh, in general, it's very easy for, uh, for the FDA user to use OpenMP. Basically, you just need to specify the OpenMP number threads. And as I have often to, to say, uh, state something about the OpenMP open stack size, and then you can achieve a factor of two on a four-core machine, which might be already reasonable. Um, however, if you do the programming development, that there are some issues I, I I told you, and it really makes sense to use tools to get handle uh, to to handle this this issue. Um, so far, MPI outperforms MPI. Uh, sorry, MPI outperforms OpenMP which doesn't have to be the case. Uh, I mean, that's trickier. It, that's uh, probably this statement is, is not that correct, but we can talk about that later. And in general, the performance is bad, Okay, to be honest. It's, it's not good. However, in the context of FDS, it's fine. 
I mean, FES is a very complex uh, uh, software, which means you cannot expect a lot. So here, it is fine, especially what Daniel did. Um, OK, and that's it. So I'm, I'm happy to take uh, questions. Do we have a question? Any questions? Yeah. OK, we have a couple of FDS developers. <laughs> I just want to make a comment that um, FDS 6.1, which is the current release, has the OpenMP turned on by default. So when you download um, FDS or buy PyroSim, you're going to be getting this, essentially, this factor of two assuming that your computer has at least four cores. Now, if your computer has, and I'm just talking about a single computer, let's say working on a, a single mesh, if your computer has more than four cores, then there's not much more improvement. No. You, you really want to start speeding things up, and you've got very large jobs, then you have to start looking at MPI. Um, so first of all, I just want to really thank uh, you and and Daniel um, for the amazing work um, that Daniel you did, did. <laughs> and Daniel has, has done. It's, it's incredible, and um, just say how uh, uh, what an amazing collaboration it, it, it was. Um, and and then my my question is uh, this, the the tool that you skull. Scalaska. Scalaska, is that available? <laughs> yes, sure. It's open source, available, and uh, well, it's basically scalaska.org. Uh, if you Google for Scalaska, well, okay. Or if you use any searching machine, you're gonna okay. find. What OS does it typically run on? Uh, it should run on. Uh, so, um, not really sure whether it can track uh, applications which run on Windows, um, but as you can use the. So there is an instrumentation part in Scalaska which looks into the application and one which presents you this stuff. So basically, that's not Scalaska; it was Cube. Um, but this one runs also on Windows. But um, to be honest, I'm not really sure whether the, these guys look into Windows applications. So you can run it on a Linux cluster and then look on a Windows PC on on the results. Okay. Any other? <laughs> Questions? No? So okay, in, well. in this case, and then I've got a question to, to myself, uh, one which leads to the next talk. Um, so um, Susanna is going to talk about uh, uh, the new pressure solver. And uh, I would like to point out why it is so important to relax the restrictions of domain decomposition FDS in, uh, with respect to HPC. For example, you cannot really put um, mesh boundaries above above the fire. That's something you, you don't want to do. But that's something which will limit the scalability in here. So I showed you that um, the MPI version works fine. However, when uh, dealing with complex things, the load balancing will get very important. So imagine you've got four meshes, split them on four MPI ranks. The, uh, the, time, they need to, the, uh, the time MPI needs to compute these meshes will not be the same. It will depend on the size of the mesh. Okay? And imagine mesh 3 has the fire in it. The execution time will be dominated by this mesh. It doesn't matter how fast these guys are. Okay? However, if you are capable of splitting this mesh, for example, automatically, into two meshes, 3A and 3B, you could say, well, maybe rank 1, it's just an example, it takes a mesh 2 and 3B, and in the end, you end up with a short execution time. Okay? So the, in this case, it doesn't matter how many processes you throw in. It will always be this time. And as long as you cannot split this mesh, and I'm sure you're going to check more about uh, this issue. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>